Are you ready to have a go at some verbal reasoning UCAT questions? Yeah! So what we're gonna do is take three questions, one long, one medium, and one short, and I'm gonna show you the fastest technique for each of those to how to go through them to maximize your score on the verbal reasoning. The first one we're gonna do is a long one, and it is a horrible one, and I'm showing you on purpose because you'll get lots of these in the exam, and you need to understand how to tackle them. So stick with me for this long one, know that it is horrible, so if you find it difficult, don't don't worry and then we'll go on to the nicer ones after once you've done the hard work of getting through those and then stick around for the end because I'm going to show you where you can get some really good verbal reasoning free resources so that you can maximize your score when you sit your UCAT this is the first question we're going to have a go at and the way it's going to work there are four questions for this passage so I'm going to give you a minute to do the first question and then after that I'm going to flick to the second question of the same passage I'll give you 30 seconds to do that then I'll flick to the third question to give you 30 seconds and then the fourth question another 30 seconds and then I'll go through the answers so have fun enjoy and I'll see you very shortly Okay, so let's have a look at some answers and go back to the first question. So firstly, let me just say, this is the first rule for really big questions. And this is a really, this is a whopper. This is five paragraphs. All of them are, you know, three lines each. Some are four lines. This is long and it's wordy and got loads of stuff. So for the long ones, this is where when you first pass this, this is getting in the way of you answering better questions. Not only is it long, it's got these type, it's this type of questions, the, the following passages. I say we skip this, but the thing is to, to note, when you skip, you guess, you flag, and you move on. So you always guess, because it gives you, you know, if you're guessing all four, you'll at least get one mark from it. But the problem is we will waste too much time otherwise. So we can flag this one so that we come back to it at the end, but this is a monster and we just want to not waste our time with it. So guess, flag, move on, but we'll go through it. So if I was to come back to this and have a go, 
it depends how much time I had. I might skim read it first and just get a feel for what's being said in the paragraph. Or you can do the targeted read, but I think the targeted read is better for, for medium sized ones. And if it's small, I'll just read it. But this one, I want to, um, like I said, skip, but now that we're going through it, let's do it. So the way that I would do this is first, I'm using this as my guide for where to look, right? So to me, the biggest thing is this 1854. It's very specific. And from having just very quickly skimmed it, I can see that there's an 1854 here. So based on the following passage, Australia's first steam railway was built in 1854 because, so we want the year that's gonna tell us where we find what we want looking for and a reason. So Australia's first steam railway was opened in Melbourne, Victoria in 1854. Okay, so now we, look, we're in the, we know we're in the right place. Now we're just looking for a reason for it. Following a meeting of local people, shares were offered at £50 each, at least uh, 6,100. Railways were thought of as good ways to make money. Um, okay, so it doesn't say why it was built, but that's maybe something. With the growing population and the nearby uh, Ballarat Goldfields, Melbourne was booming. Okay, so it was booming. It was a way to make money. I don't feel like we've got a why. I'm going to quickly read the next few sentences, and if I don't find something, then I'll maybe probably something to do with money. So the plan was to move people and goods between the port and city and reduce the high cost of shipping goods. Okay, so yeah, so here's maybe it, right? The port and the city and reduced high cost of shipping goods up the Yarra River. So I'd probably say something to do with that. So now we'll look for the answers, right? City was determined to beat its rival Sydney in the race. Not seen anything about Sydney at all, in fact. Oh, Sydney opened the first one a year after Melbourne, didn't it? But yeah, so it was before that anyway. Local people wanted to travel by train and visit the Yarra River for sport and recreation. Didn't see anything about that. Freight and the growing population need to be moved between the port and city. So freight is the cost of shipping. The plan was to move between the dirt and shipping up to the Yarra River. Prospectors and their families needed to travel from Melbourne to the Ballarat Goldfields. It does mention the Ballarat Goldfields here with the growing population and nearby Ballarat Goldfields, but it doesn't say anything about them wanting to go there. So my hunch is C. Let's see what it says. But can you see how long that takes? I hate these questions because it's so detailed and the answers they offer are so random. This is why we don't want to waste time on this. You'll see when we do other questions, it's so much quicker. Okay, good. <laughs> the answer is right. So C, because uh, paragraph two states that the plan was to move people and goods between the port and city to reduce high cost shipping up to the Yarra River. Okay, so there we go. This, this thing here, yeah. Like I said, perfect. All right, cool. Let's go on to the next question. Second question, when the decision was made to construct the first steam railway line, the principal investors were, okay, so this, we're looking for decision, steam railway, principal investors. Okay, so shares were offered, but it doesn't say anything about a buyer. The decision was made to construct the principal investors. So they, someone who's investing. So the plan was to do the goods between there and here for the station. So now what I might do at this stage, I'm just kind of like talking you through rapidly what goes through my head. So I'm probably going to look for colony of Victoria, wealthy in the colony of Victoria, the government. So let's have a look from this now. Okay, here we go. So it says the original railway absorbed two others with some lines had gone bankrupt. So the colonial government was made part of Victorian railways. So maybe that's what they mean. I don't see any other big one that suggests investors. So I'm gonna go with this one, wealthy individuals who resided in the colony of Victoria. Okay, let's see what it says. C, okay, perfect. Oh, you know what? I've got that right by fluke. I meant to go for this one. <laughs> I actually meant to go for this. The wealthy individuals. Okay, why is it the wealthy individuals? Let's have a look. So sorry, I, I've got this right by accident. Um, I meant to say the government, the government of the colony of Victoria. Okay, so let's have a look. Option C is correct because the first paragraph informs that Australia's first steam railway line was opened in Melbourne in Victoria in 1854 following a meeting of local people. Shares were offered, but then it doesn't say that they invested. I, I, okay, fair enough, but this is when it first happened, right? So I guess it's one of them that it's not obvious, but then I, I suppose on balance, most likely out of all of these. Okay, I see what they're saying because this is the first and it's telling you that people were offered shares. So I guess you have to assume that they bought it, which I hate because 
doesn't necessarily imply that. However, like I say, my intended answer was this. Colonial government made it part of Victorian railways, but it was actually because they went bankrupt. So that's why I'm wrong. Okay, at least I get that. Fine. Okay, moving on. Next question. So all of the following statements are correct concerning the development of railways in the Melbourne area prior to 1900, except these are the ones that will really catch you out. So we're looking for the false one. You get questions like this at medical school and, and they drive me crazy because they like it's like which of these is false and it's and it's it will really catch people out okay straight away we can rule this out because it's talking about what happens in 1901 i think here i would just read all of these because i've got a feel for the text by now and i probably just want to see what i feel like read them and feel what's happening so due to its belief in private enterprise the company the initial rival company had organized its affairs well and had successfully taken over other lines. So it didn't say something about absorbing something somewhere. Main rail lines were poorly planned, likely to prosper. The original Ware Railway Company absorbed two others. That's okay, so that one is true, therefore it's not our answer. Many new railway lines were established on a wave of enthusiasm, but lacked careful selection of routes and clear demand that is necessary for success. Yeah, so that's the same. These poorly planned. Railway lines were established on a wave of enthusiasm. Okay. Fine. So I'm, I feel like that one's not it either. As some railway companies went into bankruptcy, the only organisation with the financial strength to save the situation was the colonial government. Okay. So this is where, <laughs> uh, you know, you learn from your scars, right? <laughs> I, I, we got this wrong last time, but then, yeah, the government took that over. So that's right. So I'm hoping that this is correct. Let's have a look. So let's see what D says. The, uh, the colonial government wanted to, uh, the state to be in charge of the railway services so that it could make a profit from passenger fares and charges for the carriage of freight. I don't think it said anything anywhere about that. It didn't say anything about their reasons for it. So by process of elimination and the fact that I don't recall any of that, I'm going to guess this one. Let's have a look. Okay, cool. cool. So uh, option D is correct because it is the one option for which there is no support in the passage. Okay, there we go. As there is no reason to believe that the, colon the colony of Victoria always wanted to take over the railways uh, strong though the belief was in profit and private enterprise when the railways were first built in the end the railways needed to be bailed out by the government okay fine cool okay let's move on to the final one i promise you the other ones are not this hard we I thought we'd start with the the hardest because i wanted to illustrate to you exactly why you shouldn't dwell too long on these i'm going to show you better methods in the next ones and actually it's going to be much better let's get this first crappy one out of the way right so final one thank god according to the author the single biggest problem that long distance travelers faced in the early 20th century was so right straight away early 20th century so that is anything after 1900 so let's just straight away go to here and and for this Partly because I'm fed up of this bloody passage. I'm going to just read this and let's see if we can work it out from that. When the Commonwealth of Australia was established in 1901 and the colonies became states, the short-sightedness of having three gauges, narrow, standard and broad, became evident. Consequently, in 1917, a person wanting to cross the continent had to change trains six times. Only by 1970 could a passenger remain on the same train. Okay. I think this is going to give us what we want the lack of coordination in timetabling therefore so there could be lengthy periods of inactivity okay so i don't think it says anything about that the different gauges of track of track retained in different states necessitating a change of trains whenever the gauge of track changed okay that could be it that's what it's talking about here this three gauges narrow standard and wanting to cross the continent had to change six times so i think it's that one let's see uh, that freight traffic seemed to be given priority over passenger traffic so it's not said anything about that here and this is the only bit talking about in the 20th century the limited toilet arrangements and opportunity to obtain food were only made very short where such facilities are not necessary so another tip that this brings up is that when once you've found the answer i i'm only doing this for demonstration purposes I would not look beyond this. I was fairly confident, like I said, I could show you the exact point in the passage where we're talking about this and I could say exactly, you know, like for like what it's saying here versus that. So 
another time saving thing. Remember that for the verbal, well, for all of the UCAP, but particularly the verbal reasoning, the speed and accuracy is the most important. But here, speed is so important. So, you know, we could have wasted, I don't know, 30 seconds maybe just looking at this and just trying to scan the text when we already found a pretty good, solid, likely answer. So, I hope that I'm right now that I've said this. Let's have a look. So, B, yeah, perfect. Option B is correct because although there are several elements of truth in all four options, B is the only one directly addressed in the passage uh, when in the final paragraph is stated when the Commonwealth of Australia was established in 1901 and the colony became states, short-sightedness of having three gauges. You've heard me read this, so you don't need me to hear me read it again. Okay, so that's it. Um, so we'll move on to another question now for you to have a go. I promise that that was the hardest because we wanted to get that out of the way first, and then we'll move on to a better one shortly. All right. Okay, so have a go at this question. The way it's gonna work is I'm gonna give you a minute to do the first question and do what you want to do to prepare. Then we're gonna to flick to the second question after 30 seconds for that one, then 30 seconds for the third and 30 seconds for the fourth, and then we'll finish. So, ready, steady, cook. Okay, well done for having a go at that. Now, here's how I would have a go at this, right? So what I would do with this one is probably do what we call the targeted read, right? And you can use the salient features of each one, of each question, and you scan the text for it. So, so I'm just gonna scan this text looking for anything to do with studied, learnt, um, yeah, what other words can we think of? Um, yeah, examined maybe, just anything that's a synonym or is gonna tell us a little bit about Roman, Roman ruins. So we're looking through here, legacy, Philip Burr, then studied literature, so studied, but you didn't talk anything about Roman ruins, interested in architecture in Roman Italy, Renaissance man, investigate the fabric of Roman ruins. So investigate here, investigate the scan for the rest of the text just to see if there's anything that refutes that so as an architect you represent you need an expertise massive won a competition uh, his deaths 
Michelle is technical mathematical genius, a million bricks. I think we, we can rest assured that that has confirmed this. So I will say, I'm going to put this as, uh, so studied the architecture of Roman ruins, physical fabric. This is, so this is what we'd call a synonym kind of question where they are just using different words to say the same thing and just trying to see if you understand the difference between the two. So I'm going to put that as true. Uh, let's have a look. Okay. Option, so true. Option A is correct because the first paragraph explains that uh, Brunelleschi, actually, I know my Italian, CH is a, is a K, Brunelleschi uh, investigated the physical fabric and design of Roman ruins. Okay, perfect. So good. Well done. Okay, so second question. Let's have a look. So the only churches Brunelleschi designed were built in Florence. So we talked about Florence, so we know he built them in Florence. He mentions Florence a few times. It says Florence and it doesn't do anything else. So on the one hand, it could be true. On the other hand, he could have built stuff somewhere else. Um, and yeah, maybe you don't. He could have done other stuff elsewhere, but you don't know. But then again, all it talks about is Florence. So I'm going to say true. Ah, oh, balls. <laughs> Can't tell. Okay, fine. So option C is correct because the passage mentions the Brunelleschi uh, completed Florence's cathedral, but does not mention if Florence was the only place where he designed a... Oh, yeah, amateur. Sorry, that was a bit of a silly mistake by me. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I thought about it, but <laughs> didn't quite get it right. Okay, no worries. Let's move on. Okay, so next question. The crane invented by Brunelleschi was operated using animal power. So, let's see. I thought I saw, I saw something about ox, was it? So, we're looking for animal beast yeah specific animals named so let's have a scan and we think it, we're also talking about the crane right so scanning for bits of the crane da, 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 nothing here nothing here nothing here da, 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 architect well, okay instead of boring you uh, I, I remember from scanning down here um that he invented a crane where was it um do, do, do. so he invented a counterweight a hoist and reverse the pulleys so power of a single ox so actually again this is where it's tricksy because i don't see any mention of the word crane but here we go it talks about counterweight four million bit counterweight hoist using the gear and pulleys single locks could move muscles, da, 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 to protect he issued one of the first modern pa patents in other words da, da, da. so he doesn't mention the word crane but i think that the point hoist and counterweight so i'm going to put that as true okay yeah perfect so a is correct because the third paragraph mentions that brunelleschi's hoist used the power of a single ox i disagree with this explanation although it's right it's confirmed that i'm right i disagree with this explanation because there's there's a lot implied by the crane unless i'm missing something actually no mention of the word crane here okay i don't think so let's have a look control f uh, crane yeah, there's literally one mention of the word crane in the question. So um, I think that explanation does make a lot of assumptions. Um, however, you know, we're right and we've got the right idea. So let's move on. Okay, so Brunelleschi was a self-taught architect. It doesn't say anything about a mentor. And I don't think it says anything about he studied literature. So it said he studied something else. He became interested in, he became interested in architecture. So it doesn't imply that he was studied, that, sorry, that he was mentored. And it talks about him studying other stuff, but not particularly, becoming interested is not studying, does not imply mentorship. But then it also doesn't mention anything about him teaching himself. So I would say can't tell. It's, in, it's not said for sure. So I'm going to guess can't tell here. Let's have a look. Option C, brilliant. Option C is correct because although the first paragraph mentions that he studied literature and mathematics, it does not mention if he later studied architecture or if he was self-taught. So there we go. Right, so, but the thing to take away from this is there are things that try and catch you out. They try and imply things here. So he's, he's trying to talk, so he's trying to catch you out by saying he was taught this, um, so he was he studied this and then he was interested in something else and it's asking you a question about the something else. So just be careful of these sorts of things because this is exactly what they'll try and do. It may make, make you think, oh yeah, well, you know, studied this. Um, and then you'll you'll go, well, yeah, okay, well maybe it's, it's talking about self-taught, but he's talking, they're talking about a, a different thing. So yeah, just these are the kind of things to be careful with. 
what we're going to do here is we're going to give you a minute to do the first question so you've got time to do a little bit of a read and then answer the first one then after 30 seconds we're going to change to the next question you'll have 30 seconds for that one 30 seconds for the next one 30 seconds for the final one so two and a half minutes in total to do all of these questions so ready steady go Well done for having a go at that. Let's go and have a look at the explanations. So this is a relatively a small one if you look at it. So it's only it's four paragraphs. Yes, but each one is probably only two lines long, uh, you know, two and a half max. So I feel that like this is one of the smaller ones that you could if you're a fast reader read rather than do the targeted read. OK, so I'm going to read it to you. Most towns have a war memorial to remember fallen servicemen and women. Our town has a memorial clock. Built in 1920, it is on top of a stone plinth in the town square. It commemorates the local people killed in the First World War. All their names are listed on the plinth. Rail travellers often relied on the clock to check whether they were on time for a train since the station is a leisurely walk of less than three minutes away. That is until a crane working on the new building accidentally crashed into and seriously damaged the clock. <laughs> Should the repaired clock look as it did before the accident? Many people want this since it is part of the town's history, having been featured in many photographs and paintings. It is where the town's annual Remembrance Day service is held. This is a thrilling read, as all of these uh, verbal reasoning questions are, by the way. Uh, an alternative proposal is to have a digital clock on the revolving screens. God, sounds awful. Electronic firm has offered to pay for such a new clock powered by solar energy, suggesting that the names on the plinth should instead be inscribed in a book in the town hall. Relatives of those remembered on the plinth strongly object to this. So do the local civic society members who object to the names of those killed being removed from public view when the town hall is closed. But some people have signed an e-petition in favour of anything to modernise the town's image. 
Wow, what a delight that was to read. Okay, so fine, probably would quickly skim read this as it's a uh, short passage, but let's go through some questions. So, thought it was built in the town square to tell rail users the time. Okay, so it didn't tell us that. It says somewhere, I remember, uh, it commemorates it commemorates the local people killed in the First World War. So the answer to that should be false. Let's do, so let's move on to the next one. And actually, just before we move on to the next one, you might think, well, it actually doesn't say whether the clock was built in the town square to tell rail users the time. It doesn't, it, you could say, well, it doesn't say why it was built. So you could say can't tell. But I think the fact it says it commemorates the local people killed. So that is that in, in the word commemorate is the insinuation of the reason for its existence. It does say that they use it to tell the time, but um, that is actually not that is not actually the reason why it was built. So when we look at the answer here, it says okay. So the correct response option B is correct because the clock was built as a war memorial to commemorate see, the local people killed in the First World War. Okay. Okay, second question. So the clock on its plinth is the town's war memorial. Okay, so this one I believe is true because let's have a look. Uh, so here we go. Most towns have a war memorial to remember fallen servicemen and women. Our town has a memorial clock. This follows, right? It's not. It's not just to. Th this is a bit of an annoying passage because it's one of those where it says lots of separate sentences. But sometimes they are not linked, sometimes they are linked. This time, the two pieces of information that you have together are kind of, you can amalgamate those to give you the answer to this. So most towns have a war memorial to remember the fallen service men and women. So most towns do this to, to remember people. Our has a memorial clock. So our town has a memorial clock. So that's saying, so it, by my book, that makes that true. The clock on the plinth is its town memorial. Let's have a look. Correct. So yes, yeah, see what it says here. Option A is correct because the first paragraph states most towns have a war memorial to. There we go. Remember the fallen service men and women. Our town has a memorial clock. There we go. Uh, and okay, so it's got a bit more to. To it commemorates the local people killed in the First World War. As then okay, so basically, so yeah, so all of this follow-up stuff. I, I was I was kind of right. Um, <laughs> right for partially right reasons but yeah that's essentially those that first paragraph is saying that they have that memorial instead of an, another type of memorial okay cool all right we're doing okay okay so third question moving on one of the paintings showing the historic clock in the market square with people scurrying by is by L.S. Lowry. I do not remember it saying anything to do with L.S. Lowry. So it talked about people scurrying by, but I don't see anything about L.S. Lowry anywhere. So it doesn't say it's not by L.S. Lowry. It doesn't say it is by Alice Lowry. So to me, that would say that it's only a partial truth, but this is the operative part. This is the important part that it's talking about. So I would say can't tell. Let's see. There we go. Can't tell. So option C is correct because while paragraph two states that the clock is is part of the town's history, having been featured in many photographs and paintings, no additional information is given about the paintings, i.e. this L.S. Lowry thing. OK, so final question of this set. Um, oops, sorry, I moved on to the next question there. Um, OK, so the suggested revolving digital clock would be powered by a type of renewable energy. So it said something about solar energy somewhere. Where, where do we find that? Oh, so an electronics firm has offered to pay for such a new clock powered by solar energy. So here we go. So this seems very obviously a true to me. But then I'm thinking, well, you don't want to infer knowledge. And how much is inferred knowledge saying a, renewed, a renewable energy source and solar power? To me, I would say I would just trust my gut and say that it's true and that it says that they're suggesting. So. The suggested revolving digital clock would be powered by a type of renewable energy. I'd say yes. I think that's a pretty obvious one. But I sometimes trip myself up on these sorts of questions, being like, "Well, should we assume that it's a it's a renewable energy? Maybe I'm just being ridiculous." So let's see whether I'm right. True. Okay. Option A is correct because the paragraph, paragraph three states an alternative proposal is to have a digital clock on revolving screens and electronics companies offered to pay for such a new clock powered by solar energy. Okay, there we go. Right, fine. So that that's a short one and a fairly, let's say fairly easy one. So well done for having a go at all of those questions. Don't worry if you found it difficult. They are designed to be like that on purpose so that I could illustrate some of those things. As a gift, like I said, there are a few places that you can get some great resources. So if you go to the future.website, there is a free resources section where you can get your very own UCAT 
guide. We also have a really fantastic verbal reasoning playlist that you can check out here. Otherwise, if you're still struggling and you just really need that good score or your score is not improving, check out this video here and you can have us help you with your whole application to make sure that you get into your first choice medical or dental school. And thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.